Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. Today we are going to take a look at the final prices from the fall of 2018 Morphe's auction. We'll start with a bunch of Thompsons. Uh, the 21 is traditionally the most valuable, most expensive Thompson, and somewhat to my surprise when I was out shooting them, I actually agree with that. Not just from a historical standpoint, but it's the nicest shooting of the Thompsons. This was a gorgeous one and actually pretty fun to shoot. Uh, now, we went on to look at a bunch of others. This is a uh, basically a 1921 production converted to 28 uh, for the U.S. Navy. This particular one didn't sell, which uh, means usually means that it didn't meet whatever the reserve price was. Uh, I do not have any way of knowing what that reserve was, so don't have any data on that. Um, one of these two 1928 A1s uh, produced during or just before uh, World War II, one of them was pulled for the sale, and again, I don't know exactly why they may have just decided to move it to a later auction. The other one brought basically 23000 so you see a little bit less value, less commercial value, uh, in the 1928s made by Savage. Uh, now, the latest one that we had a video on from this particular auction was an M1A1, which is the, the last World War II pattern. Now, this particular one was a dealer sample gun, uh, which means it wasn't, it can only be owned by NFA dealers, and it also failed to sell, so I don't know what the reserve was on that one either. This was by far the star of the video series for me, an original second model FG42, live and transferable, went for $160,000, which is um, a bit less than you see some of the other ones that have gone for recently, historically. I think someone got a really good deal. That gun was fantastic. At the far opposite end of the spectrum of awesomeness is the Ingram Model 6. These are neat guns, and they're cool for their connection to Gordon Ingram of Mac 10, Mac 11 uh, notoriety, but they're really, they're inexpensive budget submachine guns, and they were from the very beginning. And there were actually two of them in this auction. This one had brought 6,600. Uh, the other one in there actually brought a bit more because it had a case and it was in a little nicer condition. Moving on to some of the more modern uh, machine guns, we had a Smith & Wesson 76. Unfortunately for me, uh, the book on these was published, uh, got a copy of just after I got back from my filming session. Uh, this was, in fact, a tool room prototype Smith & Wesson 76, and at 13200 someone got a really good deal on it because they also had a second standard Smith & Wesson 76 that went for the exact same amount. So. Uh, congratulations to the buyer of that one. Another really good deal for someone who's looking for an M14 was this guy. Uh, M4, transferable M14s are really quite pretty scarce in the US, and this one was not just that, it was also an experimental h and uh, I probably would have gotten more if it had the Gorilla Gun barrel actually installed in it, but it didn't, and went for $20,000. Uh, the 639, this is basically the export version of the uh, the Vietnam Colt Commando, a very cool, very historically significant machine gun in the AR-15 lineage. Uh, it's a two-stamp model, so it has a registered intact suppressor on it, $27,000. We typically see M16 variants going for about thirty grand, so that kind of fits. This MG0815 went for about double what they typically do, and that's because it was a really really fantastic example of a post-war or an interwar updated and modified 0815 with the anti-aircraft sights and a bunch of other features. Uh, that was a fantastic gun. I was actually a little sad that I wasn't in a position to bid on that one myself. Uh, the Bename FCA went for 33 grand, which is way more than you would expect for a Hotchkiss Portative, which, it's, which is the same basic mechanical gun, but there were very few of these 1909s. This is an American adopted military machine gun. It's an awesome piece for collectors, and I'm not surprised that it went high. I'm also, in, in a way, not surprised that this Romanian Schwarzlosa went a little bit low. Um, heavy machine guns like this one are just magnificent pieces of technology and of machinery, and in some ways you would expect them to bring a lot more money than they typically are today, but there are some downsides to these, namely their weight, uh, their ammo consumption, they're not super sexy, they're not in a lot of video games, and there's there seems to be a, a depression in the market for these sort of water-cooled heavy machine guns. There are a bunch of guys out there who collected them decades ago and really recognized uh, their importance historically and how cool they are uh, mechanically, but the things are just really heavy and they're kind of I mean, for the same reason that I ended up selling my Vickers, a lot of people aren't really interested in them. They take, they're a lot of hassle to take out and shoot. So 
for someone who's interested in getting into machine guns, I think there's a tremendous opportunity in some of those, the, the World War One era, you know, 1900 through 1940, call it, you know, through the 30s, uh, water-cooled machine guns. The prices have dropped on them. There's a lot of really interesting stuff out there, and, uh, and I think that's a cool opportunity. But let's move along to the next thing, which is the Colt 1919 tank machine gun. I'm a little surprised this didn't go higher, um, it is, it's a very rare example, but I think it's one that really is kind of a niche interest. So a lot of people like the 1917 water-cooled, a lot of people like the 1919 air-cooled. This thing as an intermediate sort of experimental gun, yeah, a little less. Now it's interesting to look at this 24 millimeter Swiss TB41 anti-tank gun. Went for $20,000, keep that in mind for just a moment. Um, there are, I think, two of these in the country. A very cool piece of small artillery for someone who's into artillery. But then again, artillery is big and bulky and making that ammo is expensive and difficult. And so what we actually see is that a rather similar gun, a Swiss Solothurn S18 with a wheeled carriage, went for actually about 20% more, $24,000, because this is a gun that's much easier to actually get ammunition for. It's actually easier to transport around and to shoot. Uh, and that's kind of the same sort of rationale why you see with a lot of rocket launchers, like a live Panzerschreck here, why they don't bring all that much money relative to other NFA things. So $3,600, that's a lot, but compared to machine guns, it's very little. And that's because where are you going to get Panzerschreck rockets? Like, there's not that much advantage to having a live one over having one that's been deactivated, because let's be realistic, you're not actually going to go shoot it either way. Now, moving away from the NFA stuff, we'll take a look at this uh, Seche and Fuchs double rifle, a double barrel bolt action. Pretty cool gun. $36,000 seems like an awful lot of money to me, but I will make no claims to be an expert in sporting rifle prices. So that is what it is. Congratulations to the guy who bought it. Uh, the Niagara rolling block went for a little more than I was expecting. Uh, this was at the high end of its estimate, 10, 10 grand, 10,200. I was really curious to see if there would be enough interest. This is really a kind of eclectic niche little little corner of history, and it's actually pretty cool to see that there was someone, actually two people in order to bring the price up to that, two people who were in fact interested in that to that level. Now the Webley, on the other hand, this single shot WG target, I think there, there was not a whole lot of interest in this, and I'm sure whoever got it is extremely happy with their purchase. At three grand, it's not that much more expensive than a standard WG target in that kind of condition would have brought, and this is truly a one-of-a-kind gun. So whoever got that, I'm sure is extremely happy with it, and uh, congratulations to them. There were two of these U-boat line, line throwing conversions. I think that's what they are. I can't guarantee it. They both went for right about two grand. Um, I'd be very interested to find out more about these things, what they actually were, and why they show these slight differences when they're basically sequential guns. So, yeah, who knows, that information may come to light someday, or may not. And then lastly, we had a pair of cabin pressure flare guns. These are post-World War II, um, and they both went for exactly the same amount, twenty-seven, basically called $2,750. And those certainly would have gone to some dedicated flare gun collectors, because that's another fairly eclectic area uh, to be to be collecting. But then again, as you can see from those two, there's a bunch of interesting variation out there in flare guns. And in a lot of places, those are substantially less regulated than proper firearms. So it's not that surprising that there are going to be at least a handful of really high-end dedicated flare gun collectors out there. Anyway, that's the extent of uh, the Morphe's Fall 2018 auction. If you're interested in the other guns that they were selling, uh, you can go over to Morphe's webpage and take a look at the entire catalog and see what everything went for. And uh, we'll be back with the next Morphe's auction sometime in the spring of 2019. Thanks for watching.